Dr. Herrick, and she's going to be speaking on dietary intake assessment using ASA 24. I'm going to give a brief um, introduction before, and then I'll turn it over to Dr. Wambogo. Uh, Dr. Edwina Wambogo is a nutritional epidemiologist at the Office of Dietary Supplements in the ODS Population Studies Program. Her work focuses on dietary assessment, assessing dietary patterns, child nutrition, and nutrition and aging, as well as using data from health surveys and epidemiological studies. Prior to joining ODS, she worked as a nutritional epidemiologist at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention National Center for Health Statistics. Sorry, there's a, a helicopter going overhead. Um, in the Division of National Health and Nutrition Examination Surveys. She supported external researchers who are using NHANES data through the revision of the NHANES tutorial and supported the creation of NHANES data visualization tool. While at CDC, she continued to work closely with colleagues at NIH to characterize dietary intake and dietary behaviors of the US population. And she also provided service to the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee while she was working at the National Cancer Institute. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Edwina Wambogo. Thank you. And we'll Thank you for that introduction, Jill. It's always nice to see people you've worked with for a long time. So thank you. Let me share my screen. Can you see my screen yet? Yes, looks great. All right. So thank you again for that introduction. This presentation will describe the methodologies employed in uh, dietary assessment in terms of dietary supplements and there is the respect to their strengths and weaknesses. I will go over this very briefly because Dr. Cohen talked a little bit about this yesterday. And then I will describe the considerations in the collection of the data and then provide an overview of the enhanced dietary supplement data collection process. I will also not talk about this that much because Dr. Cohen talked about it yesterday. I will talk a little bit about the available validation studies for dietary, assess dietary supplement assessment methods as an addition to this presentation today. I wanted to look at what the dietary guidelines say about dietary supplements, especially because this is very important for us in the nutrition field. And this is what the dietary guidelines of 2020, 2025 say about the place of dietary supplements within the context of total healthful diets, that in some cases, dietary supplements are useful when it is not possible to meet nutrient needs from other sources, like during pregnancy. So outside of what the dietary guidelines say about the place of dietary supplements, from all the presentations that we have had, especially from Dr. Johanna Dwyer and from Dr. Cohen yesterday, we know that the supplement, the prevalence of supplements use is high in the US and has increased over time. And therefore, when we're looking at total nutrient index, it's, it's uh, very important that we account for them. And as Dr. Cohen was saying, if we do not include the nutrients that come from these dietary supplements, we are likely to overestimate inadequacies of intake. And we are also unlikely to underestimate the intakes that are above the upper intake levels when we are looking at population level intakes. And when we are looking at usual intakes, which is of importance for those of us who are looking at health related outcomes. It is important to account for this because some intakes from both sources, that is foods and beverages plus supplements can be quite high. And therefore we need to account for this. Now, even though Dr. Cohen and Dr. Dwyer yesterday talked a little bit about the prevalence of use of dietary supplements and trends a little bit, I still wanted to look at it a little bit today for some population groups. And this recent study from NCHS uh, among youth, 19 years and younger, looked at the prevalence of use of dietary supplements in the past 30 days in 2017-18. This is the latest data that is available. And for this population group, the prevalence of use of at least one dietary supplement in the past 30 days was 34%. The prevalence was lower for infants and toddlers less than two years of age, and was higher for this age group, two to five years old, the, the preschoolers. And then it declined into adolescents. I was very curious about this 
from my experience with my own children when they were this, at this age group, I wanted to see what uh, uh, the youth report for the reasons why they use dietary supplements or what their proxies report for the users of the dietary supplements. And for those who use multivitamin or mineral supplements and, or multivitamin supplements alone, the main reasons that they reported was to improve overall health. And those who used vitamin C supplements was to boost their immune system and prevent colds, which makes sense. If you have a child of this age group, we are probably uh, all at some point thought of using supplements for these particular reasons. Now, um, this data from the same cycle, 2017, 2018, for adults ages 20 years and over, showed that 57% of adults use at least one dietary supplement in the past 30 days. The prevalence of use was higher for women compared to men at 63.8% compared to 50.8%. And this pattern of sexual sex differences in supplement use has been shown in enhanced from the time they started collecting dietary supplements. I think one other thing that I wanted to highlight was the fact that the use of dietary supplements increased with age overall, and for men and for women, as you can see. Now, in terms of uh, looking at the trends of use of dietary supplements, this one study looked at the trends of use among uh, children or youth and adolescents, that is children and adolescents uh, up to age 19 years of age. And it's from 2009 through 2017, 18. And the finding that was for, for the use of any dietary supplement, the prevalence of use increased for the ages 12 to 19 years of age. And the prevalence of use of two or more supplements increased for the ages two to five and 12 to 19 between 2009, 10 and 2017, 18 in the US. Now, the, the, you remember the talk about the use of multiple supplements and we will come to it later. So it happens also among children, not just among adults. In terms of adults, the prevalence of use also increased between 2007-8 to 2017-18 from 48% to 56% overall for adults 20 years and over. And when this was looked at for the different age groups among adults, also the prevalence had increased in that same time period. Now, uh, in terms of the issue of stacking that Dr. Johanna Dwyer was talking about, this is among adults, and I was just talking about the ones among children. This same time period in 2017-18, when this study looked at the adults, the number of supplements that adults 20 years and over use on a, in a given day in the past 30 days, almost one third reported using more than one supplement, two or more that is, and almost 13, almost 14% 14 reported using four or more supplements in a given day. And the prevalence of using several supplements in a given day increased with age. Now, if you think about uh, this age group of 60 years and over, and you think about the number of many other medications that they use, we know that this is important. And also, if you're using more, more than one supplement, then we can imagine the amount of nutrients that you might be getting overall from all the supplements that are being used. And therefore, it's important to account for them. Now, we say that there is really no standardized way to look at uh, the prevalence of use of supplements or the nutrients that are obtained from them. Nevertheless, as Dr. Cohen was saying yesterday, long-term intake instruments have been used to assess supplement use that is frequency-based questionnaires or screeners, and short-term intake instruments have also been used in particular 24-hour recalls. Food diaries or food records have also been used. And supplement inventories are used either alone or in combination with these other instruments. I like this NCI tool that kind of gives a breakdown of what you should be considering when you're looking at the different assessment methods. It is focused on foods and beverages, but it actually also applies to supplements also. Some of the factors that this tool talks about include the research question and scope of interest. For instance, are you looking at total intake or you just interested in some nutrients? Would you be choosing an FFQ, for instance, versus a screener in that case? The study design and the time frame of interest. Are you interested in a, a intake on a given day? Are you looking at what has been consumed in the past? Is it a, a prospective study or an interventional study? Then you think about the sample characteristics in terms of uh, how long your question 
questionnaire is, what you're expecting in terms of completion time, the memory requirements, how difficult it is cognitively. And then of course, you have to think about the measurement error that is associated with the tool itself. We have heard a lot about measurement error when we think about 24 hour recalls or FFQs in terms of food and beverages assessment. And they also apply to dietary supplements. Now, 24 hour recalls can have been used, as I said, mostly uh, for capturing 20 dietary supplement intake. And the online tools actually allow for the collection and coding of all the reported dietary supplements in a very nice way, like the ASA 24 does that very nicely. Uh, and we know that 24 hour recalls generally capture very rich contextual details and they are of low cognitive burden for participants. Nevertheless, in terms of dietary supplements, they are unlikely to capture those that are consumed episodically. And also because you the, the participants generally will not bring the, the, uh, the bottles that of the supplements that they're using, they may not remember all the details of those supplements. And therefore, as a researcher, you may be forced to assign some default values to those so when you're looking at the nutrients themselves, then you might likely not get the right values in. Also, there is a time burden to consider because for the most times, uh, the 24-hour the, the recalls collect the dietary supplement data in, in conjunction with foods and beverages. So it may take a long time to complete. I said that the food records and food diaries have not been used that often to look at dietary supplements intake data. Nevertheless, if they are used, they collect data in real time and therefore they are very, um, you know, they would be more, what do you say, they, they, uh, they collect data. So they are more accurate because they're collecting the data in real time. But they would be, if you think about it, they are more costly in terms of time and labor. You have to record everything as you're consuming. So it's a little bit difficult sometimes. And they are also unlikely to capture episodically consumed supplements. But also in terms of supplements, we always think about the, how people react when you're looking at them and they're reporting what they're consuming. They change their behaviors. This is also applies to dietary supplements. We know that dietary supplements are generally not consumed. For instance, if it's a, a prescription supplement, someone may not consume, is, consume it as is required or they may change the dosage, they may skip supplements on given days. But if someone is recording it, is asking them to record it, then they may change their behaviors based on that also. In terms of the fruit frequency questionnaires, they are mostly used in large studies, large epidemiological studies. Uh, they may just ask for foods and beverages, but some of them also ask for supplements in there. This is because they are most, uh, the most cost-effective tools for large studies. And they will collect data on usual intake straight up so you don't have to worry about the complex statistical methods. Those of us who have tried them know how difficult they can be. And so you just get the usual intakes that you can use to look at the disease uh, nutrient intake associations. And also they capture episodic use of supplements. So they are useful in that sense. Nevertheless, the FFQs that have been used in the US have been very varied in how they are constructed. And so comparing those results is very difficult. Also, if you're thinking of constructing uh, an FFQ and you think about what Dr. Diana Dwyer was talking about, for instance, yesterday about the label database that we have at ODS that is a product of both the USDA and, and the ODS, you look at the number of supplements or the number of products that are in the market. It is impossible to have all those products in your FFQ. You can only put in a few. So depending on the population that you're looking at, depending on what type of supplements that they use, the products that they use, you may miss some of them. And also FFQs can be quite cognitively difficult because of the time frame that you're looking at or the questions that you include. Now I just say that the inventory, the supplement inventories uh, can be used alone or in conjunction with the other instruments. And they are generally very accurate and they collect very detailed information because you're looking at the product label Nevertheless, they are very costly and time and labor intensive. And depending on where you're collecting them, if you're collecting them in the home, fine, but sometimes those products don't even exist anyway. But if you ask the, the if you're collecting it outside the home 
and you're asking your participants to bring the bottles or bring the labels, they may not forget, they may forget to bring them. I will briefly look at uh, the enhanced methodology for dietary supplement data collection just to, to make you recall what was discussed yesterday. The National Center for Health Statistics is responsible for the enhanced survey methodology and the data collection activities. This is a complex multi-stage probability sample survey of uh, a national representative sample of the US population. It is a cross-sectional survey nevertheless of non-institutionalized populations in the US. The data is collected and released in two year cycles from about 10,000 participants every year, at least up to this point, it has been that way. It may change in the near future. And Enhance has been conducted in two major parts. There is an in-home interview through some questionnaires. And then participants are, go to the mobile examination center where we, they have follow-up exams and they have lab sample collection. And then the first 24 hour recall is collected at this mobile examination center. There is a wealth of information that comes from enhanced data and that's what makes it very attractive for users of this data. The survey has been running for a long time since 1959. And in 1971, the dietary component was added. Now you can see this umbrella shows all the, comp the dietary related components that have been collected in enhanced continuously. And I just wanted to mention that ODS has been funding the dietary supplement component since 1999, the continuance enhance, and also has funded the collection of several biomarkers since then. As I said, dietary data is collected in three parts in Enhance. The first part is in the in-person home interview. Here, demographic data is collected together with health history, lifestyle, beh behavioral uh, questions are asked in this in-home uh, interview. And also the 30-day dietary supplement used is asked here, plus the uh, supplement inventory is collected here. Since 1999, Participants are asked to report all the supplements that they consume, including botanicals and, and acids also. They are shown a hand card that shows them samples of dietary supplements and the categories that they belong to, including antacids. And if they say they consume any of those kinds of products, then they are asked to show them the bottles. And if they cannot show those bottles, then they just report them verbally, and then they are entered into the system. These are some of those uh, hand cards that I was talking about that I used in hand. So you see the bottles of supplements, they are shown those samples, and then they are shown the different categories that those supplements would belong to, and also examples of antacids. After that, in-home, in-person interview, participants are then asked to go to the mobile examination centers. This is where physical examination measurements are taken. Lab specimens are collected. And the first 24 hour recall is collected here. Now this first 24 hour recall combines the foods and beverages and also the dietary supplements consumed in the past 24 hours. What is interesting is that in Enhance, because they've already reported the supplements at the home, that list comes down with them to the mobile examination center. So they are asked to report if they consume those same supplements that they had already reported in the, in the FFQ and the, in the, and the inventory and any new supplements that they consume in that past 24 hours. After that, there's a post exam that, that happens also in Enhance in, on the phone, over the phone three to 10 days later. This has been a staple of Enhance and can change, but in Enhance, the second 24 hour recall is collected at that point. Also for this, this same recall, it is a combination of foods and beverages and dietary supplements and antacids, which are queried individually. For this one also, the follow up that list is still in existence from the FFQ and the, and the um, inventory. And they are asked if they consumed any of those supplements that they had reported and any new supplements that they consumed in the past 24 hours. Now, since Enhance uses these multiple methods that I've just talked about, to assess dietary supplement use, it is possible to compare those methods using this data. And this is what the study by Co and Italia just did. So they, uh, they looked at the, they 
created four different methods of measuring dietary supplements using the two different methods that are used in Enhance. Actually, there are three methods, but because they combine the inventory with the FFQ and the 24 hour recall, we can say there are two methods here. And then they were looking at the most appropriate method for looking at the prevalence of use and estimating nutrient index from those different methods. They found that overall the methods were consistent in determining what the, the most commonly used supplements were. And in this case, also multivitamin mineral supplements. And for the single nutrient in, uh, supplement, that was vitamin D. And in terms of the likelihood of reporting consuming a supplement, the participants are more likely to report consuming using a supplement using the FFQ compared to the 124 hour recall. And they were even more likely to report using a supplement when they when uh, they combined the FFQ and at least one dietary supplement. And the results were consistent when they looked at the multivitamin mineral supplements. Now, overall, we see that a single 24 hour recall is unlikely to pick up all the supplements that are used compared to the FFQ. And co combining an FFQ with a 24 hour recall will pick up even more supplements, including the new ones. And then just combining two FFQs at least, I mean, two 24 hour recalls comes very close to the FFQ. When they looked at nutrient index compared to the, uh, the frequencies that we just looked at right now in terms of prevalence of use, they found that a single 24 hour recall for the different nutrients that they looked at will provide a higher estimate of nutrient index compared to the others, other methods. And this was the same when they, um, this was the same when they looked at groups of the supplements, the 24 hour recalls will still overestimate the nutrient index from the supplements. I wanted to just go over briefly some validation studies. This study uh, that just came out recently from Dr. Bailey and some of you know most of these people, Janet Tooze and Ray Carroll and some of our own like Jamie Gash is here. And they are calling for most validation studies for these instruments. And I think we will back them up for that, that we need more studies to validate these instruments. This study was a, a, a sub-study of the cancer behavior risk study, a small study in Seattle. It was mostly of women and, and almost all white. There was a male questionnaire and then a phone interview. And then the participants went to a clinic where there was a, a, a label transcription also. And what was found was that the mailed questionnaire compared to the uh, label transcription and the phone interview, they were fairly similar in terms of the prevalence and also the nutrients estimates. But there was, and, and they said there was no evidence of systematic error in either of them, the mailed or the phone administered uh, questionnaire. The principal place where the error was seen was in participants being able to sort of think or report the, the, the composition of the products that they were reporting. And also they were not very sure of the categories that the products belonged to, but they were very comparable. For this other study, which, is a, which was a sub-study of the vital study also in the same area, was also a small study. There was a mailed self-administered questionnaire at baseline and at three months, and then an in-home interview and a label transcription. And then they also had some semi-fasting blood and sports urine sample collection. And they compared the, if the two questionnaires and then compared the first questionnaire with the, the questionnaire with the in-home interview and transcription and the biomarker with the questionnaire. And they found that the correlations between the uh, repeat assessments of the questionnaires were quite high, as you can see, 58 to 82% correlation. Uh, there was a slightly lower correlation when you're comparing the questionnaire to the uh, in-home questionnaire, in-home interview and the transcription. And sometimes the, the biomarkers did not match up with what was reported. This third study is probably the main validation study to date. This, in this particular study, the participants were more diverse, but still they were mostly older adults, uh, as you can see. 
they used uh, there were two groups one group had an inventory and the other one did not and they compared the ffq and the inventory group and there was generally good agreement between the two different time periods where the ffq was used as you can see quite high correlation and also the nutrients were fairly correlated between between the two ffqs showing that the intake is pretty consistent uh, for those who use dietary supplements but in terms of the nutrients estimated from them, they varied. And this has been shown by most of the uh, validation studies. It depends on the nutrient that you're looking at. They can be very varied in terms of how correlated they are with the label transcription. For the third study, which was also a, a MEC study, a small study of Hawaii and Los Angeles, also fairly diverse, but a little bit smaller, and also of just adults which use the DHQ that Dr. Houston is going to talk about in a few minutes, and also looked at 24-hour recalls. This was the first one that looked at short-term uh, intake instruments versus FFQs. And they compared the first, uh, first administration of the FFQ to the second one, and then the second administration of the FFQ to the 24-hour uh, recalls combined. And they found that the correlation of the products reported in the two FFQs between the uh, first administration and four to six months later were quite were varied depending on the nutrients also. And um, the agreement between the recalls and, uh, and the FFQ was also varied, but generally high for those supplements that are used more commonly. So what this concluded was that the questionnaires actually do fairly well when the supplements are consumed more frequently. In this validation study also for cancer prevention study, which was a smaller study, also mostly white, there was a self-report FFQ administered twice and then six 24-hour recalls and they compared the first FFQ to the second one, the second FFQ to the 24-hour recalls and the second FFQ to the last recall that was closest to that FFQ. And the finding was that the average of the multiple 24 recalls were quite close to the FFQ, that second FFQ for the different nutrients. And there was no difference by sex. But when they looked at the last FFQ compared to that last 24 hour recall, there were differences that were seen by sex. Uh, in conclusion, I just want to say that from these results that we have seen and presented from Cohen et al. and all these other uh, validation studies, we can say that combining multiple tools might be the way to go if you can do it. But however, if resources do not permit, then you have to choose the most appropriate method and you have to think about those strengths and weaknesses and then choose the most appropriate method based on your research question. We want to echo uh, the call by Bailey et al, just that we need more validation studies, particularly for these short-term in, uh, intake instruments, because we know there are error structures and they are generally preferred to FFQs if we can do it. Here are some resources that you can look up after this. And I just want to thank you for listening to me. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Oh, that was excellent. We have time for a few questions here and I'll look, I think folks have access to the chat. Um, you can also, I think, unmute yourself for questions. Um, so I'll let folks, um, I'm just checking to be sure I can see everybody here. Um, but one of the things that you talked about was the call for I mean, sort of both the com combining instruments, um, what are, some of the benefits are there, as well as, you know, the trade-offs for just choosing the most appropriate tool given the situation, and then the call for, for more research. Are, is there more research that your um, specific, you know, specific questions and things that, that you'd like to see more validation work? Well, we, uh, from all the validation studies that we have looked at, you can see that they have focused on adults Mm -hmm. and uh, some of them just older adults. If we could look at what is reported by the younger populations, that would be uh, see how the instruments work for those different age groups. Also, most of those validation studies have not been that diverse in populations. 
So if we could get more diversity in, in these assessments, that would be great. And as I was saying, we need more validation for the short-term intake instruments. So, um, and Dr. Gash is here with us and I would invite her to come along and, and contribute if she wants to. Hi, <laughs> let me just move my screen over. So I'm actually, yeah, so we had just published a paper and I really think that um, the big take home message was that we actually only had five studies where we could actually look at the validation. So right there just tells us we need a lot more studies. Um, you know, we found, you know, often, you know, there's way, there's many different ways to do validation. And the most common that we found was using 24 hour recalls as the gold standard. And there was fairly good agreement. But again, this is, these are only five studies. And um, I think for large studies, um, they need short instruments, short questionnaires, especially large cohort studies. So trying to get better validated, like Edwina just said, short um, questionnaires on supplement use is really critical. Um, I think I'll stop there, but definitely that's what we need because 24 hour recalls for supplements can be a little, a bit long for studies to be able to do. So it, there's always that balance with the um, sort of granularity of data and being able to capture, yeah, capture the data that you need in the, in the short time. I think we'll have some. I should also say that it, the level of precision um, also differs. So, you know, for a lot of the ways we capture supplement use, especially in the short, the little, the questionnaires, um, you know, being able to rank order nutrients works, but if you want really accurate, precise estimates, this is a lot harder to do with these methods. Mm -hmm. So um, it also has to, you know, the researchers have to decide what level of information that they need for their study. Um, is categorization enough or do they really need those precise, accurate measurements? Thank that's you. So yeah, that's so helpful. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Edwina. Were you going to? Oh, no, no, I was just saying thank you, Jamie. So I think we'll have time at the end for additional questions after we've heard Dr. Herrick. But I think we'll go ahead and move on to our next talk on dietary intake assessment using ASA 24. And I'll take a minute to introduce Dr. Herrick. She is a program director with the Risk Factor Assessment Branch of the Epidemiology and Genomics Research Program in NCI's Division of Cancer Control and Population Sciences. Her focus is on developing, designing, and conducting nutrition-related research related to dietary methods, dietary instruments, measurement error, dietary surveillance, and nutritional epidemiology. Dr. Herrick oversees the web-based automated self-administered 24-hour diet assessment tool, or ASA24, and you'll hear more about that. She also is serving as the project scientist for the NIH's Common Funds Nutrition for Precision Health, powered by the All of Us Research Program. Before she was at NCI, Dr. Herrick was a nutritional epidemiologist at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And in this capacity, she estimated usual intake distributions to assess the nutrition status of U.S. population groups and conducted analyses on dietary behaviors. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Herrick. Thank you. And um, Dr. Wambago, please, please stay close because we'll have more time for discussion and questions at the end. Sure. Thanks very much for that introduction. Let me see if I can get the screen share to work. Um, and make sure that everyone can still hear me. I've lost you visually, so there we go. We can hear you and see you. Perfect. Um, well, so my task for today is to talk about some of the tools that NCI has for dietary assessment intake. And thankfully, um, I get to follow the fabulous presentation by Dr. Wombogo because I don't have to go into all the details about um, the all the um, 
the important things that we consider when we're building these tools. Um, so I get to talk about the fun part and talk about the tools themselves and uh, set a little bit of the context for the development of these tools. Um, so this is what we think we wish, wish for, right? We wanna be able to capture everything that somebody is eating. We have this video feed that would capture not only what they're eating, but when and the context that it, that it occurs in. Um, so I think that's probably something we're aiming for, but we don't quite yet know what the unintended consequences of some of this type of monitoring uh, would create. So we think we want this, but we've got to have a lot more methodological studies uh, to figure out if that's really what we're after. So instead, we need to stick and to stick with the tools that we have at our disposal. Uh, and I'll focus on the main dietary assessment methods that we have for population scientists science studies. Um, here, free frequency questionnaires, 24-hour recalls, um, and the dietary record. And with the small caveat that the records could also include um, observational or, or weighed uh, components. So to provide a really brief background, background um, of the presentation today, I'm gonna try and provide really a broad overview of the development of a lot of these tools because you need the context that they've been developed in. And then I'll touch on two tools that NCI manages, the Diet History Questionnaire or the DHQ, and also the automated self-administered 24-hour dietary assessment tool or ASA24. And during that uh, presentation, I'll also touch on how specifically these tools capture supplement intake and some of the return of results uh, that these tools incorporate. So as I'm sure everybody's well aware, there are lots of challenges in dietary assessment. Um, they reply, rely on self-report. So people have to be able to recall um, or complete questionnaires and they're prone to measurement error. And that's important because um, the bias uh, that that creates, and then the loss of statistical power. So we want to, when we want to look at diet disease relationships, um, we don't have the statistical power. Um, they also have high burdens. This is not only for respondents, but also for researchers, and they can be quite costly. Um, food frequency questionnaires can be less, and that's the reason they're often used in, in large um, cohort studies. And then something I won't really touch on today is really the limitations of the food composition databases. But that's another important consideration when choosing tools and thinking about um, the results of any dietary assessment. So what I wanna talk about just briefly is the technological explosion that's occurred. And really, when you think about the tools that we have now versus what we had about 10, 15, 20 years ago, it's amazing the things that we have now. Um, and these new methods have really come up to increase accuracy, make it a lot easier for respondents to complete these tools. And most importantly, if you've ever done any coding of 24-hour recalls that were conducted in person, um, you know that automating that process to get to pair the what's reported as food and drink into the nutrients and food groups, that's an incredible innovation. Um, but it also leads to a reduction in cost for both researchers and clinicians. Um, and these new tools we want to be able to use widely through multiple ages across diverse populations and to address lots of different research questions. So you know quite well what food frequency questionnaires are, and they have started out as what you see here on the screen, uh, questions that ask about particular food types over particular uh, time frame, a month, three months, six months, or a year are common. Um, and then uh, they have skip patterns. So an individual would say yes or no that they had these foods, and then there would be additional questions about it. Um, and sometimes these food, fre food frequency questionnaires uh, can ask about portion sizes. It's not, uh, not something they always do. So in terms of innovations that have come forward with food frequency questionnaires, um, the obvious uh, innovation is movement to a computer-based platform. So if we get out of using paper and pencil, we can program in the skip pattern. So there's fewer missed questions and it allows for more flexibility. So we can change these questions. Um, also there's cleaner data and it can all be automated. But of course the disadvantage is all we've done is move that food frequency questionnaire onto an 
uh, computer platform. So it's still an FFQ. It still suffers from the same types of error that we that I'm sure you've already discussed. Um, and but there can be a different kinds of errors uh, that are introduced by having access to computers or other technological issues. Nonetheless, um, uh, NCI has developed a food frequency questionnaire called the Diet History Questionnaire, which takes the paper base and puts it in a computer form that can be access accessed both on a desktop and a, a mobile phone platform. But a lot of research went into how best to organize the questions to make sure that it was easy for respondents to cognitively move through the questionnaire and think about the foods or beverages and supplements that they've consumed and get a better um, recall for, for those items. Um, so here you can see the question asking what beverages an individual would consume. And so this is a gatekeeper question. They tick the foods or beverages that they've consumed, and then it will go on and ask additional questions about those items that the respondent said yes that they've had. Um, quick note about the DHQ3. Uh, this version of the questionnaire is based on NHANES 2007, 8 through 2013, 14 with some additional um, nutrients from NDSR 2017. Um, so in addition to all the research that went into figuring out how best to ask the questions, DHQ is based on the intakes reported in the US population. And specifically, I wanted to make sure we talk about how does this tool ask about dietary supplements? So here you can see the gatekeeper question for dietary supplements in DHQ. This is the list of, of all the supplements an individual would be presented with, and then further detail would be asked about each one of those. So I'll take you through that very quickly. Um, once they've indicated what, question, what supplements they consumed, there are pathways for those particular supplements. In this example, I selected a multivitamin, and it asks about um, how often individual the individual took it, um, what type, whether it contained minerals, um, gummy types, um, and then how long the individual had been taking it. Now, it also, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm getting confused. I was gonna talk about brands, but we don't cover brands here. Um, that brings me to the 24 hour recall. Um, so the 24 hour recall, as you've heard discussed, um, is a short-term instrument and here I'm gonna focus on the USDA's multiple pass, automated multiple path, me, multiple pass method or AMPM. Here you can see those five steps um, that are used and the ideas to provide a logical pathway for individuals to recall the things that they've consumed in the last 24 hours. Um, so this pathway is used uh, for a national nutrition surveillance system and Haynes. Um, and it is the reference method for self-report uh, items. And for those who've used NHANES, you probably noticed that when after the data is collected, there's a bit of a lag between the time that data collection closes and when new files are released. And the dietary data, in fact, is some of the has the some of the has the largest lag for any of the data files to be released. It can be anywhere from two to three years uh, by the time the data is collected, cleaned, and then released. So when we talk about innovations for the 24-hour recall, we really want to think about how we can reduce that time frame and how we can make it easier for individuals to complete. So innovations in this space include eliminating the interviewer. Um, interviewers are expensive and can be impractical. If we don't require an interviewer, that means a respondent can complete the tool whenever they have time and aren't beholden to trying to schedule an interviewer. And because it's electronic interviewing, uh, the whole process can be automated. And that's critical, particularly for the auto coding. So as soon as an individual has completed their recall, by the press of a button, the output file is generated in real time. And so responses are available for the researchers to look at the data files, but also there's a respondent nutrition report that can be made available to respondents at the end. So to summarize, um, for the development of ASA 24, really the challenge was to think about what can we do above and beyond 
through frequency questionnaires and interviewer administered 24 hours that are going to make at least some of the challenges um, lessened going forward. So the task was to collect multiple high quality recalls at a low cost for large scale nutrition research. And that began with, the, and that stimulated the development of ASA 24 um, in 2006. And a beta version was, re was released in 2009. Uh, this effort has been supported across the NIH, but had its start uh, and home at NCI. Since it's been developed, uh, there are some different versions available. Um, not only are there US versions, but there's also a Canadian and Australian version. The US version is available both in English and Spanish. And over the years, we've made innovations and improvements to the system. Um, in 2016, the system became available both um, on laptop and smartphones and was enabled to collect food records. Um, so we have a pattern set up over the years um, to typically release a new version of ASA 24 every two years and have any single version available for about three years. And at the bottom of the screen, you can see some of the enhan enhancements and linkages that we've released in the past and things that we're doing moving forward. I'll talk about the respondent nutrition report um, and happy to answer questions about any of the other ones uh, later in the, in the talk. So, just like the name says, uh, ASA 24 is um, an automated, self administered 24 hour dietary assessment tool. Um, it's web based and it, that allows for that auto coding to happen, happen. There are over 13 million pathways that enable the foods, beverages, and supplements that a person reports to be linked to a nutrient database so we can see the nutrient and food groups at the push of a button. And this is really an incredible innovation that makes dietary assessment accessible and available for researchers to include in their studies. And of course, it's based on the automate, automated multiple pass method, the reference method for self-completion tools. Um, so we know that it's following a standard uh, that's well known and well received in the research community. Uh, it was developed under contract uh, by um, NCI and Westat. And in addition to the speed with which it can process data, another key feature is that it's available at no cost to researchers. So again, this makes dietary assessment accessible for research purposes. So when I talk about ASA 24, it's really a system of two websites. We have the researcher study researcher website where researchers can log in, create an account and create a study and send out uh, requests for individuals to complete uh, their particular study. So you too can call yourself a researcher on the ASA 24 website, create an account and set up a study. Then there's the respondent website, which is where individuals log in and actually complete the 24 hour recall or record. Meanwhile, researchers can continue to monitor the study uh, and obtain responses once data collection is complete. Quick comparison of AMPM versus ASA 24, you can see that there's still the five step method. It's a slight difference because when you implement it on an electronic format, it's, uh, you've got to make some concessions, but it still follows that same general pattern. In addition, ASA 24 contains a few other things, bells and whistles, you might say, um, in, com in comparison to the AMPM. Uh, collects information about food source, location of meals, who meals might have been consumed with, and electronic device use during meals. So there's more contextual information that it collects. Here you can see the way ASA 24 is rendered both on uh, a cell phone on the left and then a desktop computer uh, on the right. And here I'll go through how a respondent would find a bagel in the system so you can get a sense for how the system works. Here, we've typed bagel into the search bar and in the middle gray panel, you can see the search results. Now, if I had had a considerable number of results, I could use the far right to filter my results to get a smaller number of results to look through. Once I've identified the term that I wanna use, I can select bagel, I push that, um, and then it'll follow another pathway based on that first answer to capture additional information to get that really rich detailed information we know 
24 recalls can collect. So here for the bagel pathway, it asks me whether or not um, it had any fruit or vegetables, what type, type of bagel it was, and then goes on to ask a question about the portion. And just in case you wanna make sure that there wasn't anything else included on that bagel, there's an additional question that provides you an opportunity to say, hey, there were other things that I had in my uh, bagel. And of course, for this particular uh, group, I wanted to make sure you could see what the pathway would be for a multivitamin. Um, here, putting multivitamin in the search bar returns 17 results. Now I will say that depending upon what you put in that search bar, you will get different results. So I could put a space between multi and vitamin and I would get different results. Um, I'd like to say that we have the search engine the same quality as Google, um, but we're not there yet. We're always seeking to try and tweak our search engine based on popularity and, and spelling, um, but it's, it's a challenge every time. So here you can see um, the main results in the gray panel, but again, you can filter your results over on the side. Once you've decided what best meets your needs, you select that and you'll move on to another cascade of choices based on that initial um, choice. So for multivitamins, um, these are the options for um, how it was formulated. I took a screenshot from my cell phone so you could see how that was rendered. And then I chose a women's formula multivitamin. So this is the, the cascade of additional questions you would get through ASA 24 about that particular multivitamin. And there is a question here you can see about the brand name. Um, it didn't fit on one screen and I didn't wanna mess up the flow, so I wanted to show it to you here. These are the brand name options for multivitamin. And you can see um, if an individual says, wow, I see the list, but it's not what I have. Um, there is an opportunity for a respondent to select other and that will pop open a text box so the respondent could write in the name of their particular uh, supplement. So that's covered the supplements. I'm gonna provide a little bit more information about ASA 24 in general to get a sense for the whole tool. Um, and one of the questions I often get is, well, how long does this really detailed uh, process take? And looking at administrative data across the whole system, on average, it takes around 24 minutes. So that's, that's not too bad for the detailed information that you're collecting. We know the system is predominantly used for research. Here you can see there's around 66% of our researchers or individuals using the system on the researcher site say they're using it for research, but there's still a fair percentage of clinical and teaching uses. We can also look at the publications over the years. And this publications represents through September, 2022. So it's not fully complete for um, 2022. Um, but you can see there's been a dramatic increase in the last five years. And it represents over 600 publications, peer-reviewed publications, and we have just exceeded over 800,000 dietary recalls or records collected through ASA 24. And this word cloud provides some information about the types of questions that ASA 24 has been used to address. Lastly, I wanted to provide a little bit of information about a comparison study of dietary assessment using ASA 24 and AMPM. I've provided the reference down at the bottom of the slide, uh, but this study looked at the prevalence of dietary supplement reporting between ASA 24 and the interviewer administered AMPM. Um, and I'll just get to the punchline here. Um, you can see that reporting on any supplement, both tools, provided fairly similar results. Um, and the same was true for reporting a multivitamin, multimineral supplement. So using the same methodology, one using the interviewer administered, the other as a self-administered tool, um, there's uh, evidence that there's little difference in reported supplement use by mode of administration. So that closes out my discussion about the tools themselves. And now I wanna talk about the, nutrition resp the respondent nutrition report. So here you can see on the right panel, the way the ASA 24 Respondent Nutrition Report or r, &R looked until just recently. We've had a, a huge uh, revision of the website. Um, 
And here you can see the revised version. Um, and you can check it out yourself if you go to the website link at the bottom. Um, what I will say as well is that this particular nutrition report um, uh, is available both in the DHQ system and in ASA 24. There are slight differences um, in that the ASA 24 respondent nutrition report provides a really brief information about the, the foods and beverages and supplements that a respondent reported on their given day. That's not included in the food frequency questionnaire. Um, it just doesn't make sense. Uh, but the RNR for the ASA 24 system is about a 10 page report. Um, this is usually page three of the report that provides information on uh, total intake, your total calories, um, and then your four larger food groups. We went through a user testing process with the ASA 24 report that included eye tracking and, and interviews. And we got some really great feedback that this page was well received. Uh, they liked the information, and we found that individuals really wanted additional information in the report and resources for even more information that we couldn't provide on the report, and that's why you see the link to the dietary guidelines. This is the fourth page on the report that goes through the daily food group targets, and the respondents felt like this was a great use of graphics, and they were easily understood, so they knew how much that they had eaten compared to the target, and what particular subgroups uh, their intake was coming from. The next page in the report talks specifically about nutrients and foods to limit. Um, here, we wanted to make sure that respondents understood that this was an entirely different type of present presentation, and so we changed the orientation um, of the graphics, and so they can see what they have eaten compared to the limits and respondents um, reacted very positively to this. Then we came to some challenges. Um, and this page lists out all the nutrients from foods and drinks. And in summary, respondents really just felt like they were overwhelmed. They didn't know where to focus. Some folks were confused by the particular nutrients. One respondent in fact said, gosh, what's copper? Where do I get that? What is that in? And wanted to learn more. Um, and then there wasn't a distinct pattern with the nutrients um, and they wanted more information. So these were all revisions that we made uh, to the respondent nutrition report. And so um, the minerals are now focused on one page and one color. Uh, similarly, vitam vitamins are on another page and another color. Um, so we addressed all the concerns that respondents had for this particular page. Um, but then we got to the last page of the respondent nutrition report uh, the one that includes the nutrient intake from foods, drinks, and supplements. And perhaps because it was at the end of the report, it was a large table, um, folks really just were overwhelmed. And it was clear uh, that this page didn't go over well, very well. And respondents really had a hard time understanding uh, what this information meant and how they could use it. So um, we were very fortunate to find um, some extra money to do a, a project. And over the pandemic, um, there was a project that went forward to test respondents' re reactions to two different forms of this report. Um, here you can see a table on the left and a graphic on the right. Um, and after going through a great deal of uh, user testing and identifying what people really liked, what they didn't understand and making revisions, um, we were set to move forward and prep, uh, program the graphic and discovered that we couldn't program it and have had to go, go back to the drawing board, um, but have discovered there's a way to basically integrate the table and the graphic. Um, so that's coming out in the next probably few months. Um, so you can check it out on our website when it's all done. Um, next, I'm going to talk about a new report, uh, and this is the first time that we've presented anything about this particular report, but um, we've been hard at work uh, developing a healthy eating index report. Um, Dr. Reedy has been instrumental in moving this forward, and this will come out as another return of results option within the DHQ3. Um, so I'll, I'll show you some really brief slides on this. It hasn't gone live yet. Um, we expect to do that in the next couple months, um, but the idea is to provide a really tailored report to respondents 
so they can see based on their food frequency questionnaire responses, uh, what their overall diet quality score was, how they um, scored within each of um, the foods to eat for good health and the foods to limit. And then there's specific targeted information about changes that they could be making in their own diet. Um, and so this is another page of uh, the HEI report. Um, things, this page specifically relates to foods that they would limit. Again, this is an example based on um, just a, um, a, a version of the DHQ that we went through so we could um, provide some results for. Um, and that is the end of my show and tell for our uh, respondent uh, nutrition reports. I just wanna take a moment to acknowledge the army of individuals that make all of this happen for ASA 24 and DHQ. Um, you'll notice a lot of familiar names that I'm sure that you've heard from folks um, in your presentations today and uh, yesterday perhaps as well. Um, so I, I just wanna say thank you to all of those involved and say that I'm ready for questions and I'll stop sharing so we can see everybody. Great, excellent, thank you so much. Um, so if we could take time now to have um, questions for both Dr. Herrick and also, excuse me, Dr. Wambogo, um, that would be great. I'll pause and let folks um, have a chance here. I'll, I'll open up the chat again and if folks want to come off to put their um, put their cameras on or just to come off mute or raise their hand they can go ahead and do that for their questions um one thing oh here we go there's a i'll go ahead and um, look at a question is there an option to export results from asa24 as an excel file or csv file for analysis by researchers yes great question um yes asa24 exports six different output files for researchers. Um, they are CSV files. If you have a large study and you're going to be pulling down lots of data, we also have APIs that would allow you to pull down that data en masse. So those functionalities are, are available. Great, great question. Thank you. So I was going to sort of turn it back to our speakers and ask if you each had a question um, to, for, for, for one another um, in, this, in this time um, while we've been talking about assessment. So I'll put you on the spot again. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I have any question for Houston, but I, I can see one question that just came in for, for Houston oh, again right. on ASA24. <laughs> so I'll go ahead um, and read Oh, go ahead, do you wanna say it? Sure, I was gonna read it out. Um, can we use ASA24 for teaching and research at the same time? Um, there are no prohibitions to setting up as many studies as you wish. Um, so could you use, I, I think the only reason that you might not be use it might be able not be able to use it for both research and teaching at the same time would be IRB provisions. Um, if you weren't allowed, you know, share that data um, in a teaching environment. Um, but yes, by all means, you can set up a study and uh, do research and, and teach with it, no problems. I see another great question um, that just came in in the chat, and I'll go ahead and read that. Um, this is a question about how often the food list is updated in the ASA 24. Are there efforts to add more culturally diverse foods? We're working to use it for a study. And I see this as a limitation right now without having to utilize the other or recipe option. Chris, Kirsten. Yes, for Kirsten, sorry. Yeah, no, thanks for that question. So um, as you put in your question, there is the recipe option. So if an individual can't find the food in the food list, um, recipe is, is a great option. We do have a new foods tool um, that we have made available to researchers. And it is an option if you know that the population you might be working in has a lot of foods that you think are not in ASA 24. Um, what we found in talking to researchers with this new tool is that actually uh, a lot of the foods are in ASA 24, but what we can do 
to make it easier for respondents is to make it a synonym. Um, so um, if there's a particularly um, cultural word that means more to your population, you can link that to the food list terms within ASA 24, so it'll populate, so the search essentially gets better. Um, but if it is in fact a food that is not within ASA 24, um, you can use this new foods tool to add it to your study so that it'll be ready to go when you start implementing it within your study population. Um, but I, I will say there are lots of foods in there that folks wouldn't really expect. Um, we have moose bacon, uh, which was a surprise to me. Um, so, so I would say through the process of, of looking at the new foods tool, it's important to really think and look through ASA 24 to see if it is in there. We just need to find a way to, to access it. Great. We have another question um, about ASA 24. And um, this is whether you have any insight into how many studies use ASA 24 as an interviewer administered versus self-administered instrument. And then I might also just add if you have thoughts on sort of the, the pros and cons of the tool as, as both um, being administered in both of those ways. So this is a great question. We have started trying to capture the information about whether people are using ASA 24 as self-administered or interviewer administered. And I don't have any numbers about that right now. Uh, I, we're still uh, combing through the data. What we're doing is, is actually looking through all the publications that mention ASA 24 and um, going through the methods to see how they've implemented it. Um, so follow up with me in maybe a week or two and I can get a number for you. Um, as you know, ASA 24 was not designed to be an interviewer administered tool. So it's a little clunky. Uh, if you're gonna use it as an interviewer administered tool, you might want prompts that say, um, when you said you had breakfast yesterday, you reported yogurt. Can you tell me more about that yogurt? Um, so we are considering um, what it would take to develop a different mode for ASA 24 that would allow it to be interviewer administered. And I think if we continue down the thread of utilizing all the new innovative technologies that are available to us, then there's value in, in considering an interviewer administered version of ASA 24. I can imagine doing one you know, through Zoom where you maybe can't get access to individuals. The problem with not using some of the technological aspects is we'd have to think through what we do with portion sizes. If a respondent isn't looking at the selection of portions on a screen, are we providing them with a photo booklet? Um, are we capturing images and they're sending us images? Uh, there are some questions that we'd have to work through if we were using it as an interviewer administered tool. But I don't think we'd just create it as an interviewer administered tool to mirror what happens in AMPM. I, I don't think we need the du duplicative efforts. But I'm, guess, I'm guessing, Houston, in that, for in terms of dietary supplements, that would be an easier thing to do though, compared to the foods where you have to think about the uh, visual aids that you have to use? I, I think so, but my concern would be capturing all the detailed label information from a dietary supplement. Um, I, 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 don't, I don't know, we'd have to, we'd have to talk through uh, what the key pieces of information that you'd wanna capture. I'm really keen to think about how we can utilize image capture devices. Like everybody carries around a cell phone. Or most people carry around a cell phone. Um, so how could we really leverage that uh, to improve our dietary assessment methods? Right. They, uh, can you talk a little bit about the validation of ASA 24 and how widely it's used outside of the US, for instance, maybe? And what are you oh. thinking about the validation for diet supplements? Okay, so question one, how frequently it's used outside of the US? Um, so ASA 24 has a Canadian version and an Australian version. The Australian version uh, is dated back to 2016. It has not yet been updated. And I suspect that, uh, that the folks that supported ASA 24 2016 Australia will probably go with a different tool, Intake 24, because 
it's married to a different database, one that's more relevant to the types of foods and beverages and supplements that individuals in Australia would be consuming. Um, as I, I said, I wasn't going to talk about databases, um, but you may make me delve into the databases. I think that's a key piece, you know, marrying up all the detailed food descriptions to a food code to, be, to get those nutrients is a very laborious process. Like I said, 13 million pathways in ASA 24. It is not insignificant to make that linkage to a database. So their in, Intake 24 is a program developed in the UK. And for example, they already have questions about portion sizes um, in vernacular that's much more common and familiar to folks in Australia. Um, uh, ASA 24 2018 Canada is the most recent version of Canadian ASA 24. Um, I'm not sure the direction that the Canadians will go in for updating the database and the program um, because there is a fair amount of overlap uh, in the database that serves ASA 24 Australia and ASA 24 US. Um, but I haven't heard any more about that. Um, and the discussion about database kind of gets at the crux of the question about how widely ASA 24 would be used in an, in an international format. Mm -hmm. And if you can make sure that it's culturally sensitive, that it represents the foods and beverages and supplements that your population will be exposed to, then I think, yes, you could use it. Um, but the database is key and it, it's, it is not an insignificant task to link to a database. And I don't remember if there was another question. Did I miss one? One more, I believe. Oh no, I was, uh, validation, you, you can oh, talk a little bit about her, right? So validation. So um, ASA 24 2011 was validated. So that's um, the, the first version beyond the beta. Um, and that was validated with doubly labeled water. And of course we know with validation studies um, for, we, we have very few biomarkers that we can use, um, at least for energy, protein, um, uh, sodium, potassium, but that's about it. There are some new ones coming along, uh, but they haven't hit mainstream and uh, haven't been using them uh, yet. I don't know, that there's value in doing a whole new validation study on the tool if we're not gonna change the types of questions that we're asking. Um, if we're going to say, throw out the multiple path, pass method and use a totally different way of collecting information, then yes, I think we should validate it. Um, I agree there should be more work for assessing dietary supplements with ASA 24, that has not been validated um, with any sort of biomarkers, um, certainly in, in younger populations. So I think there's scope to continue working there. But I, I would stress, and this is something, I don't know, perhaps I shouldn't put words in your mouth, but I, I do think that there's no one tool to rule them all. I'm gonna show my uh, penchant for Lord of the Rings, but there's no, there's no one dietary assessment tool that will be everything and do everything. It's really important to think through what your research questions are, what your resources are, what your population can, can handle. Um, so I think those are all important and, and that's the reason we need all these different tools uh, because they have different strengths and you know, we can balance some of those things out. Very true. Well, and just to go back, uh, Edwina, some of those things I feel like um, that, that Kirsten was just saying, I think I think I heard you talk about as well, mm -hmm. um, sort of with the, you know, some of those some of those trade offs to consider there's no one tool to rule them all or that, you know, that the com combination of different tools that were used for dietary assessment intake, and then again, sort of matching the tool to your question, you know, mm -hmm. depending on how you're using the, the particular um, assessment value. So would you is, is that a fair assumption or do you think it's different for dietary? That's very true. That's exactly what I'll say. So I totally agree with her. Okay. So there's um, an additional, oh, sorry, Jamie, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I wanted to mention just to complicate everything. Um, so <laughs> with supplement assessment, we often will use 
uh, like I said, the 24 hour recall, but really the inventory method as a gold standard. So the participant brings out all the supplements they've been taking. But, you know, even that has not been, I guess, quote unquote, validated in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. Like for N. Haynes, you know, none of this stuff has been validated. <laughs> The, the questionnaire used for supplement collection has not been validated. And we kind of think, okay, but it's collecting consistent information for over 20 years. Um, so that kind of, and it's the inventory method, which we regard as pretty much the gold standard. So it must be okay, but still, you know, we haven't done really a study on uh, looking at biomarkers or even compliance, but these are very difficult to do mm -hmm. because just because someone's bringing you your supplements, did they really take them? And then do people bring you all their supplements? Because a lot of people will say they, they're not. So some of the Definitely. ones that might be a little more controversial, they might not necessarily bring out. Oh, when um, they take too many supplements. Teenagers, right. Might not feel comfortable in their home with their parents. They're bringing out some of uh, the muscle builders or the um, weight loss supplements. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of um, issues that really um, need more research and uh, we're definitely kind of behind in that area. Can I ask you about the issue of timing also there? Because like when you were, were bringing up some examples, those could be things that are used perhaps not every day or even yep. every week, but for specific periods of time or even time of year. Um, are yep. those some of those challenges um, that you that you've seen? Yeah. So you know, if you ask somebody to tell me how the supplements you've taken in the past year, you know, you might capture the seasonal ones or ones that they use when they're sick or have some GI issues. Or um, but um, then again, it's hard to recall right over the past year everything you took. So a lot of studies use the past thirty days, but like you're saying. For some supplements, they are taken when somebody has some sort of ailment, um, especially like probiotics. Um, so you might not really capture that usage. So I think, though, with NHANES, you're capturing a lot of the most commonly used or consistently used products, but you might not be um, getting at those products that are not used every day, right, that are used just certain times of the year, maybe. Um, so there's trade-offs to your, and then the 24 hour recall asking about supplements in the past day, you know, definitely probably pretty accurate, right? Cause person just has to remember the day before, but again, a lot of people, you know, may have missed taking that supplement that day. So you're really not, it's not a good way to really estimate prevalence of use. Um, and then for intake, even when we calculate like total uh, usual intake, it's very complicated with supplements because, you know, you, if the person took a supplement or not, you are dumping huge amounts of a nutrient all of a sudden into their diet or not. So uh, we struggle with this where you really do need that frequency of use also when doing the usual intake along with the 24 hour recall because it can be tricky when you're having, you know, all of a sudden 1200 milligrams of calcium versus not, but the person just missed it that day or doesn't take it every day like that. So um, to really ca uh, capture supplements accurately, you, it, it requires a lot of work assessment wise and a lot of work that um, a lot of studies can't do. So that's all. <laughs> yeah, that's really, really interesting to consider all the different issues that are at play. I, I do see another question um, about ASA 24, and that is whether or not there is a sleeping questionnaire with the ASA 24. Kirsten, could you um, comment on that? Yes, I'd be happy to. I, that's a fabulous question. Thank you for asking that. Um, yes, ASA 24 has a sleep module that was released in 20. 21, I think it is. I don't remember. Um, uh, but um, we recognized that there is interest in trying to understand this 24 hour cycle and how sleep and diet might interact. So 
there aren't a lot of tools that capture this and we figured maybe we could start uh, with ASA 24 and add in a module that could be used in conjunction with either the recall or the record to capture some additional information about sleep. Um, so there is a publication um, in JAND, uh, and I can see if I can find it in a minute and uh, dump it into the chat. Um, the, we considered a lot of different tools uh, to think about the best way to getting at this information and have it uh, live within the ASA 24 system. One idea we had been really excited about was to use some sort of visual representation where you could almost integrate the day um, and talk about food and diet in the whole flow of the day. Uh, but having a, a, a visual report like that was going to be a big departure from the way ASA 24 works and um, hasn't been tested. So um, we had to stick with the traditional pathway of um, just uh, using questions. So we consulted lots of different uh, sleep questionnaires and um, tried to think about what we could ask within the context of an eating behavior about sleep behavior and not ask about sleep, you know, too far back. Um, so the recall has 12 questions and the record has 10. Um, and depending upon how you set up your study, you can look at sleep and how it might impact eating and how uh, eating might impact sleep. Um, so it, we're, we're very excited about it. We've consulted with um, some sleep researchers to help um, develop that questionnaire. And we will soon-ish, um, I'll say by the end of the summer, be releasing a new code book to assist researchers in developing the types of variables, um, uh, wake, uh, I'm not gonna get any of them right, WASO, um, a, a, lot of, a lot of those um, variables to try and assist in that type of analysis. And I would um, make a plug for um, Dr. Marissa Shams White. Uh, she is our sleep expert and we work a lot together on uh, this particular tool. So I would say, shoot her an email if you have specific questions um, because she has been at the forefront of, uh, of developing that tool. I guess nobody asked about physical activity, but what about that? What about physical activity? Well, um, there are lots of ways to get at physical activity. Um, there is ACT24, which is a physical activity um, recall similar to ASA24, and that's maintained um, also by the NCI, different group within um, NCI. And then there's also um, a more objective measure of physical activity, something like actigraphy, where you can uh, wear a watch or, or other sort of um, physical activity monitor that will provide um, responses, you know, I think it's pings every, multiple pings per, per second, um, vast amounts of data um, that you can think about, I mean, Fitbit um, is, is a tool that, that some folks will use. Um, but in the same way that we talk about, you know, it's important to think about the dietary database, actigraphy has um, often proprietary algorithms that are used to take all those little bits of data across the day to kind of come up with a summary. And those algorithms are not known to the researcher or to the public. And they can change at the uh, um, company's whim. So it's important when thinking about those and use in research that uh, you need to understand what you're getting um, and what you'll be able to do with that information. Uh, so it's, it's kind of looking under the hood, uh, things that folks don't often think about. I have a question for um, dietary supplements and timing. How important is it to capture really detailed information about the actual timing that each supplement was, a, was consumed? And is that an area of research that you think needs sorting out for dietary supplements? Yeah, I mean, I, <clears throat> I think it would be definitely an area of research. 
um, especially timing, uh, bioavailability, uh, absorption with the food matrix, so what you're eating in combination. Um, definitely an area of research for smaller studies. Um, obviously, larger studies, this is going to be really complicated, but um, yeah, definitely. I'm thinking about the move towards precision nutrition and mm -hmm. the idea that we can really capture all the intricate reactions that are going on and, and knowing when you ate that supplement and compared to when you ate your food and when you slept, all of that information mm. yep. is key. And, and honestly, I don't know that ASA 24, we certainly haven't al validated ASA 24 in terms of timing of eating. Um, I know from looking at some of the timing data that it clumps at half hour and one hour. So I don't know if that's good enough um, for assessment of timing of eating. What is the margin of error? Does it matter if you said you ate it at eight o'clock and it was really 8.30 and you had your coffee at 8.45? Right, probably not. I think with supplements, yes, timing, but the bigger picture in timing, not that small, but um, definitely what you're taking the supplement with, right? Because we know for some nutrients, this mm -hmm. can affect absorption. So I definitely think it is an area of research. Don't think you need that level of precision, though. I think for timing in general, outside of the food matrix and what you're eating it with, um, just having some idea of when it was taken, you know, night versus evening versus morning is probably a big start right there. It's really interesting to see these commonalities across diet and physical activity and sleep and dietary assessment, or sorry, dietary supplement assessment also um, related to timing. Mm -hmm. And there's another question um, in the chat about whether in ASA 24, the question is asked about why a supplement is taken. So no, uh, we don't ask that within ASA 24. I think it's a great question. It's included in NHANES. Uh, we do know about that within NHANES. We can't do everything, but I think you could probably easily pair that um, with, you know, a, a follow-up question or, or depending upon how your study was, was arranged, you could, you could include that. Um, there's a lot of contextual information that we'd like, right? We're just going to put cameras on everybody and follow them around for, for days and weeks on end to understand everything that's going on. That would be great to have that that level of detail and all not only what but also when where why and how yep. um, and with whom so we'll we'll um look for assess more assessment tools that that can capture some of those other things um in the coming years uh, perhaps but um we're approaching our time here so i'm gonna i'm looking to jamie to see is um should we go ahead at this point and wrap up or is there sure. anything? Okay. So I really want to say thank you on behalf of everyone here um, to our two speakers and also Jamie for um, your role in the discussion. I think it was a really great questions. So thanks again to all of you who participated as well. And we look forward to tomorrow and seeing you back then. And I'm gonna pass it over to Jamie to see if she has any closing comments. Yeah, so um, this was a great session. Thank you, Edwina. Thank you, Jill. Thank you, Kirsten. Um, so actually, if anyone wants to go to another breakout session, um, because the other two actually had three speakers, so they'll be going on until 5.30. Um, so I think all you have to do is press that button on the bottom breakout rooms, and you can go to another room. Otherwise, um, we reconvene tomorrow at 11 a.m., and we have a lot of good presentations, and I think one that a lot of people will enjoy on dietary supplement quality with people from industry, FDA, um, third-party verification companies. So I think it'll be great. So that's it. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you. Thanks.